I'm Mary Meeker. I'm a financial analyst, an investor, and an American citizen. Our country's budget is a complicated subject and one that can cause emotional reactions for many people. It's my belief that a transparent and fact-based financial framework can help us all have more productive discussions about America's budget challenges that, in turn, can help lead to constructive solutions. I worked with a lot of thoughtful and dedicated people to compile this presentation called USA, Inc. In it, we take a nonpartisan look at the financials of the U.S. federal government as if it were a company. Of course, the government is not a company, but like any entity, it must manage its money so it doesn't spend more than it brings in. We look at our current and historical government collections and spending and describe how we got where we are and where it looks like we're going. Our report does not make policy recommendations, and all observations are based on publicly available data. What I will share with you today is a summary of the basic observations from a longer report we published in February. This presentation and the longer report are just starting points. Let's call this version an overview, an introduction to the country's financial challenges. To dig deeper into the data, you can view the full USA Inc. report at kpcb.com or order a printed copy from Amazon.com. Feedback since we published the report has been positive. The report has been viewed more than 70,000 times on the web. I encourage you to read the report and use it in your discussions, and feel free to share this presentation. Improve the content, engage in the debate, help educate others, help find solutions, make America's founding fathers proud. We have a serious financial challenge in our country today. Our country spends more money than it collects. Just as a business brings in money, also known as revenue, from the goods it sells, the U.S. brings in revenue in the form of individual, corporate, and payroll taxes collected by the Internal Revenue Service, as well as tariffs from imported goods. A company also has to spend some of its revenue to pay for its cost of doing business. These include the likes of rent, salaries, materials, manufacturing, and marketing. Together, these make up a company's expenses. Similarly, the U.S., or if we're using business terms, USA Inc., has expenses. These include, but are not limited to, spending on defense, transportation, education, law enforcement, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid programs, as well as interest on our national debt. When you look at the revenue and expenses of USA, Inc., you'll see that expenses have been greater than revenue for a long time. In fact, for every year except for five of the past 45 years, USA, Inc. has spent more than it has collected in taxes. This means the budget crisis that is being discussed in the House, the Senate, in the media, and at lots of dinner tables these days has been building for more than four decades. Unfortunately, budget deficits are not simply canceled out the next year when the country draws up a new budget. No, we have to borrow to overspend. The amount by which we overspend each year is added to our national debt. Our national debt is the total value of everything that USA Inc. owes. Outstanding bills, notes, bonds, and other debt instruments issued by the Treasury and other federal agencies. Clearly, we have some critical financial challenges that we must solve. Simply put, we are overspending. If USA Inc. really were a company, a turnaround expert would approach these problems by asking questions like these. How long can USA Inc. continue to lose money? How long can USA Inc. keep borrowing to overspend? Why are USA Inc.'s expenses growing faster than revenue? And can we isolate and fix the key drivers of revenue and spending? While a single factor can't explain the bulk of America's financial challenges, there is one area of expenses that is the largest by far, government entitlement spending. An entitlement is a financial obligation of the federal government to a person, group of people, business, or unit of government, or a similar entity that meets specific eligibility criteria. USA Inc.'s major entitlement programs are Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. In 2010, entitlement expenses accounted for nearly $2 trillion, or 57% of total USA Inc. expenses, up from 25% of expenses 40 years ago. Before we get into the details, we'll provide a quick review of these programs. In response to the Great Depression, the U.S. government created Social Security in 1935 to provide retirement income for elderly Americans and disabled workers. Employee and employer payroll taxes 
are used to pay for Social Security. Medicare, created in 1965, is the federal health insurance program for people at or over the age of 65, financed by payroll taxes, insurance premiums, and interest earned on trust fund investments. Finally, Medicaid, created alongside Medicare in 1965, provides health care insurance for low-income individuals and is paid for jointly by state and federal income taxes. These three programs add up to 73% of USA Inc.'s entitlement expenses, and these entitlements, most notably Medicare and Medicaid costs, are growing exponentially. For perspective, a decade ago in the year 2000, individual income taxes collected by USA Inc. were a trillion dollars, about two times higher than entitlement spending, excluding Social Security, which has been self-funded through payroll taxes. Yet in 2010, Entitlement spending, again, excluding Social Security, grew to $1.3 trillion, but individual income taxes were only $900 billion. So while USA Inc.'s individual income taxes have fallen slightly over the past 10 years, our entitlement spending, excluding Social Security, has more than doubled. In fact, the Congressional Budget Office, or the CBO, a nonpartisan congressional agency forecasts that the cost of Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and interest expenses will exceed America's total revenue 15 years from now, in the year 2025, or perhaps even earlier. These expenses, in effect, are like runaway trains. In 2025, the point where the two lines in this chart intersect is when, according to the U.S. government, USA Inc. will have nothing left over to spend on what we think of as ongoing operating expenses. Education, infrastructure, disaster relief, defense, energy policy, national parks, and medical research, just for starters. In effect, we've mortgaged our future with entitlement spending. Is this what's best for American citizens? Are we effectively balancing our short-term wants and needs with our long-term wants and needs? If a corporation's expenses perpetually exceed revenue, the company would go out of business. Of course, our country is not a business. Its mission, according to the United States Constitution, adopted by our country in 1787 as the framework for our government, is, quote, to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, end quote. In other words, the United States' ultimate goal is not generating a profit. However, it is hard to believe that maintaining a, quote, perfect, end quote, union and providing liberty and prosperity for citizens would be possible if the government couldn't afford any expenses beyond entitlements and servicing the national debt. Considering the situation, American citizens should support our elected officials in ending our country's practice of spending far more than it brings in. Already, Americans are worried about the country's financial woes. In an NBC News Wall Street Journal poll, 80% of respondents said they were concerned about the growing federal deficit and the national debt. But more than 60% were concerned about the impact of major cuts by Congress on their lives and their families. Similarly, according to a Washington Post ABC News poll, 69% of Americans opposed cutting spending on Medicaid and 78% opposed cutting Medicare. Our challenge, in effect, is we want to have our cake and eat it too. Who is willing to speak the truth about these issues and offer solutions? We need more of our elected officials to get off their soapboxes, stop promoting their ideologies, and start focusing on the undeniable facts about our situation. But if we want our elected officials to take action without fear of losing their jobs, the public must be educated about the depth of America's financial challenges. It's critical that we all learn the facts about the numbers so that each of us, in our own way, can take action to address them. The bottom line? To point our country and our financials in the right direction, we need credible short, medium, and long-term financial plans that point to a slow and steady reduction in our budget deficit. And the reality is, nearly all Americans will need to make some sacrifices to ensure that our country is an even better place to live in 5, 10, and 25 years.
Perhaps it would be easier to understand the scope of our challenges if we considered the country's financial situation in a personal context. For instance, what if an American family overspent to the degree the U.S. does? That family would find itself in a state of financial distress that might look like this. This family, let's call them the Smiths, have been spending more than they earn for a long time. They've accumulated debt from their school loans, a home mortgage, and a line of credit for modeling their home. In fact, the Smiths' net worth, the difference between what they own and what they owe, is negative and has been for many years. They want to be able to pay for their children's college and save for retirement, but given the financial downturn, their assets are worth less than before. The value of their 401k retirement plans has been cut in half, and their house dipped into negative equity value as real estate values plummeted. After being denied a loan to refinance their home, they realize that if they don't cut their spending, they'll eventually declare bankruptcy. Instead, they go on a spending diet. However, even cutting any non-essentials isn't enough. The Smith's debt is so large that they can't pay it off by only trimming expenses. They also have to increase their revenue. Both parents take on a second job. The Smiths also realize they can do more with less. They move into a smaller house and hold a garage sale to get rid of non-essential possessions. Thanks to sacrifice and prudence, they turn their financial situation around. While it sounds extreme, the Smith story should actually be familiar to us because it is the financial reality of the United States. As a result of our country's overspending and future obligations to our citizens, it would take more than 20 years of USA Inc.'s current revenue just to pay off our debt. The $47 trillion that USA Inc. owes today equals $395,000 per household, owing largely to entitlement obligations. Before we dig deeper into USA Inc.'s current financial situation, let's take a closer look at federal spending to understand exactly how America's financials got to where they are today. In 2010, USA Inc. brought in revenue of $2.2 trillion in the form of individual, social insurance, and corporate taxes. In the same year, USA Inc. had $3.5 trillion in expenses. These included entitlements, non-defense discretionary expenses, such as spending on education, law enforcement, and transportation, defense spending, and interest on the national debt. That means that USA Inc. spent over a trillion dollars more than it brought in from taxes. Or in financial terms, the country operated at a negative 60% net margin in 2010. What is $1 trillion? For perspective, for a $1 trillion, the amount of our overspending in 2010, we could buy a McDonald's grilled chicken sandwich and salad for every American every day for more than two years. We could buy an Apple iPad for every American and upgrade them with a new model every year for seven years. Or we could invest in education and match California's public school teaching salary and benefits of $113,000 annually to pay the salary and benefits of every K-12 public school teacher in the United States for almost three years. USA Inc. didn't always spend in this manner. From 1790 to 1930, federal spending averaged only 3% of the country's GDP, which is our gross domestic product, or the goods and services that the country produces. However, spending has grown remarkably since then. Today, USA Inc.'s annual spending is closer to 24% of GDP. America's founding fathers would likely be stunned by this math. What changed over time? How did USA Inc. get here? First, let's look at how revenue and expense growth compare to the growth of entitlement spending. Over the past 40 years, USA Inc.'s revenue has grown by 2.9% annually, while total expenses have grown by 3.1%. Entitlement expenses grew at 6% per year, two times faster than revenue growth and six times faster than defense spending growth. While the 0.2 percentage point difference in growth rate may seem trivial, the compounding effect over 40 years has resulted in expenses that are 50% higher than revenue. This was not caused by the current administration or the previous administration. No, all of our legislators and presidents, Democrats and Republicans, and the citizens of the United States can take credit for this problem. 
Entitlements, the biggest of which are the cost of Medicaid and unfunded costs for Medicare and increasingly Social Security, are the main drivers of our growing expenses. While USA Inc.'s budget problem may be complicated by the country's size, commitments, economy, and politics, figuring out where to focus our budget reform conversations is relatively simple. We must rethink entitlement spending if we want to make real progress with our budget crisis. The total dollar amount of entitlement expenses adjusted for inflation has increased nearly 11 times over the past 45 years, while by comparison, the country's GDP grew 2.7 times and USA Inc.'s total expenses grew 3.3 times during the same period. In effect, this overspending was paid for by increasing our debt. Just as the Smiths had to borrow to maintain their spending levels, USA Inc.'s extra borrowing became the country's current debt, up to $9 trillion, or 62% of GDP, in 2010, compared with 30% of GDP 40 years ago. The current debt level is projected by the government to increase three times over the next two decades. In addition, off-balance sheet liabilities, such as USA Inc.'s promise to pay future Social Security and Medicare benefits, without sufficient funding, bring the total debt of USA Inc. to $47 trillion. That's an increase of five times since 1996. That $47 trillion would be enough to run the federal government for 13 years at its current spending levels. Of course, these most recent numbers occurred during one of the worst economic downturns in our country's history. However, even if we adjust for the cyclical impact of the recent recession, for instance, if we take out the government's financial bailouts, including TARP, plus the economic stimulus package, we still would have an $817 billion operating loss in 2010, compared to a loss of $78 billion just 15 years ago. USA Inc.'s financial problems are not simply a result of a recession or partisan decisions. Whether we are lawmakers or ordinary citizens, we are all guilty of perpetuating our spending problem. It's time that all of us, private citizens and elected officials alike, step up and take responsibility. Any way you cut it, Medicare and Medicaid are the major stressors on our budget. And the scale and scope, plus the financial burden they place on our system, has dramatically increased since these programs were originally created. In 1965, one in 50 Americans received Medicaid. Today, one in six Americans collects Medicaid benefits. Medicaid spending growth is propelled by rising medical costs and a growing number of people becoming eligible for benefits. Since 1966, enrollment in Medicaid is up 12 times from 4 million to 49 million in 2010, and annual payments per beneficiary have increased four times to $5,000 even after accounting for inflation. Note that while Medicaid enrollment rose 12 times since 1966, America's population rose only 1.6 times. Rising health care costs are also playing a major role. Health care expenses are now 8.2% of GDP. They were 1.2% 50 years ago. If you look at the 31 developed and emerging countries, known as OECD countries, you see that USA Inc. healthcare spending equals that of all these countries combined. What makes this fact even more alarming is that America has only 35% of their combined population. To make matters worse, by many measures, we get a relatively poor return on our investment in healthcare. We may have more MRI machines than any other country, but we rank among the highest in incidence of obesity and the number of heart attacks. We spend more than our peers on medical care and technology, but by almost every measure, the health of our people lags that of most of our peer countries. And our population is aging. This means that all of the programs that were set up after the Great Depression in the 1930s to provide a safety net to our poor and elderly are now coming due. Our workers aren't supporting the same size population as they did in the past. This budget bubble will grow as the baby boom generation retires in the coming 10 to 20 years. Soon, they will begin to collect Social Security and require increased medical care. But fewer workers will be available to support them. 
Social Security benefit increases have surpassed the rate of inflation, making them even more expensive to maintain. Add that to skyrocketing health expenses, along with our ineffective efforts to contain health care costs, and we have a perfect storm of spending. It all sounds pretty bad, but it could be worse. Federal debt has been rising steadily since 1981, but since the Federal Reserve has been holding down interest rates, we've gotten a break, and USA Inc.'s cost of borrowing has, in effect, been artificially low. Rather than its 30-year average of 6%, from 1980 to 2009, the cost of borrowing was only 2% in 2010. In fact, if interest rates were at this historical average, in 2009, we would have paid $370 billion more than we did just to service our debt, and an additional $290 billion in 2010, 188% higher than was actually paid. So far, we really haven't paid the price for our rising debt, But if interest rates rise, our penalty for years of overspending will also rise. In terms of debt levels, the U.S. is certainly not leading the rest of the world. Think about the current European debt crisis. Greece, Portugal, Ireland, Italy, and Spain are in deep trouble, and their economies have teetered on the verge of collapse. How far off is the U.S.? When you compare our gross debt as a percent of GDP, the U.S. is not an outlier. But if a corporation were in this position, it would be difficult to keep borrowing indefinitely without showing signs of progress. When companies overspend and the markets lose faith in their outlooks, they often file for bankruptcy. Lockheed went bankrupt in the 1970s. Chrysler went bankrupt in the 1980s. Many savings and loan institutions failed in the 1980s. Financial institutions, including Citigroup, Bank of America, AIG, Fannie Mae, and Freddie Mac, and the U.S. auto industry almost collapsed in 2008. And the U.S. government helped bail them all out. But who will bail out USA Inc. if it fails? We can't simply continue to finance our debt by printing more money unless we wanted to devalue our currency, destabilize our economy, and make our debt even less attractive to foreign ownership. China, our biggest foreign lender, already owns over $1 trillion, or 13% of our debt. China has lent the U.S. more money than any other country. In order to continue to be able to sell our debt to them, USA Inc. must be able to prove that investor money is safe. If prospective lenders like China don't believe USA Inc. can pay back its loans, USA Inc.'s funding will dry up and the country won't be able to pay its expenses and continue to borrow easily. Is this a risk that USA Inc. can take? Just as the Smiths started to spend less and earn more in order to preserve their financial health and maintain their ability to borrow money, USA Inc. also needs to start tightening its belt. Our country must find ways to spend less and save more. We must heed the advice of one of our great leaders, President Teddy Roosevelt, who said, in any moment of decision, the best thing you can do is the right thing, the next best thing is the wrong thing, and the worst thing you can do is nothing. Doing nothing isn't a strategy. In fact, doing nothing is actually worse than doing something to try to solve these problems. Alexis de Tocqueville and Thomas Jefferson maintained optimism about the American people. They felt that, armed with the right information, the people will make the best decisions for the country. As Jefferson explained, educate and inform the whole mass of the people. They are the only sure reliance for the preservation of our liberty. Now is the time for each of us to delve into our financial crisis and get engaged in this issue so that we can preserve our liberty and sustain our prosperity. Our budget crisis isn't something we can choose to ignore. It's our duty to be involved. Armed with the facts, we can begin to solve our problems. We also have a duty to those who came before us. We must continue their work. Our grandparents built a ladder for our advancement. They invested in the federal highway system, established Pell Grants for poor Americans to attend universities, and funded research labs where some of the world's great inventions were born, the light bulb, artificial heart, personal computer, and the internet, just to name a few. Both new immigrants and eighth-generation Americans have ascended the rungs of this ladder. It has lifted people out of poverty and created prosperity for more than 200 years. But we have not maintained that ladder. As an example, in 2010, USA Inc. spent $724 billion on health care, but only $97 billion on education. 
Are we investing in the right things to keep America competitive in an increasingly competitive world? How can we continue to attract and develop great minds when we don't preserve and grow our resources for these minds? As an example, in 1965, the federal government spent approximately 1.7% of GDP on technology research and development. In 2010, we spent less than 1%. The good news here is that many companies, both public and private, have invested aggressively in research and development. We are becoming so compromised by our financial situation that it's increasingly difficult to be the America that we once were and still hope to be. Relative to other countries, our students rank well below average on mathematics, science, and reading, but we top the group in self-confidence. We are losing share to other countries, but self-confidence alone isn't enough to help us catch up. When a company wants to ensure it will be able to sustain its competitive advantage, it invests in the development of new products or services. We need to invest in our education system, research and development, and our children if we plan to remain a leader in the world. Are we prioritizing our spending properly? Are we ensuring that in the future we will tackle the big, audacious goals that propelled America to greatness in the past? How would a corporate turnaround expert tackle America's problems? He or she would look at two options, trim expenses and increase revenue. We can learn a lot from successful corporate turnarounds. For instance, Apple Computer was almost bankrupt a decade ago, but after its turnaround is now one of the most valuable companies in the world. More recently, GM filed for bankruptcy in 2009. Its products had become increasingly uncompetitive, and pension plan costs rose to 4.8% of its annual expenses. GM's net worth went negative in 2006 when it began to owe more than it owned. In fact, when you purchased a GM car, $1,600, or 6% of the purchase price, on average, went to employee pension expenses. In 2010, GM's gross debt as a percent of revenue was 82%, and in the United States, GM's retired workers dependent on the company outnumbered current employees by 10 times. After declaring bankruptcy, GM initiated a turnaround in 2009. It focused on both eliminating expenses and increasing revenue. It cut many of its legacy entitlements by swapping employee health care for equity ownership in the company, thus more effectively aligning employee incentives with company performance. GM improved its operating efficiency so dramatically that it was able to run a break-even coming out of the recession and turn cash flow positive during the next upswing in its business cycle. On the revenue side, GM moved away from a business model that emphasized costs to one that focused on vehicle quality, engineering, and styling. In 2010, the first full year after its public offering, GM reported earnings of $4.7 billion. USA Inc. needs to begin a turnaround, too. Just as a normal business or family would do, our country needs to deal with its debt and liabilities. National debt of over $9 trillion and liabilities of over $47 trillion. Let's review our current deficit, defined as 2010 overspending, of $1.3 trillion. Earlier this year, our elected officials passed legislation to reduce $38 billion in 2011 annual spending after an intense debate that almost shut down the federal government. Note that $38 billion in spending cuts accounts for only 2.5% of our annual overspending in 2010. And in our earlier example of the Smiths, who are spending $90,000 per year with $60,000 in income, the stopgap budget cut would be the equivalent of the Smiths cutting $750 of spending per year, or $62 of premium cable per month for an entire year. While it is a step in the right direction, for a country to make progress with our budget deficit, we need to pursue more aggressive moves. A turnaround expert looking at USA Inc.'s finances would throw a one-two punch. He or she would focus on the big changes necessary to fix or reduce our expenses first and then drive growth second. Few people seem to want to touch entitlement spending, but the financial loss levels from these programs are so big that we can't ignore them. For comparison, it's notable that USA Inc.'s entitlement spending in 2010 equaled the entire GDP of India. That's a staggering number, given that according to the IMF, 
India is the ninth largest economy in the world based on 2010 GDP. USA Inc. must review these important programs and restructure them so they make economic sense. Let's apply some simple but illustrative math to Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and non-defense and defense spending. Then we'll do the same for GDP growth and tax increases. If we look at Social Security, Americans are living 26% longer, but the retirement age has increased only 3% since the program was created in 1935. The last time the Social Security program had financial challenges, in 1980, the government chose to raise the retirement age by two years and reduce benefits by 5%. Back-of-the-envelope math, based on current data, suggests we can restore Social Security to long-term break-even by either increasing the retirement age by 9% to 73% or increasing payroll taxes from 12.4% to 14.2% or reducing benefits by 12% or via some combination of the three. Medicare and Medicaid must also be restructured to address the funding shortfall. However, the four percentage points of payroll tax hike or 53% benefit cuts required to balance the Medicare shortfall would be draconian and extreme. And Medicaid does not even have dedicated funding, so it's even more difficult to manage financially. Another way to help balance Social Security and Medicare is to introduce means testing which translates to paying out full benefits only to those who really need them and cutting back on payments to everybody else. Reality is that an effective restructuring of Medicare and Medicaid requires a comprehensive review of USA Inc.'s healthcare system to isolate and address factors that have been driving up healthcare costs. These factors range from social, a growing and aging population plus increasing obesity levels, to economic, misaligned incentives among consumers, healthcare providers, and payers. The bottom line is that more and more consumers demand healthcare services with less regard for the full economic impact of those services, in part because they pay only a fraction of the cost out of pocket. Healthcare service providers are generally rewarded for providing more services, largely with relatively less regard for cost effectiveness. This is a mismatch. Aside from entitlements, USA Inc. could also tackle low-hanging fruit in other defense and non-defense discretionary categories. This could include outsourcing non-core competencies, restructuring underperforming agencies, and pursuing more efficient spending. Speaking of defense, with budget deficits rising, some advocate cutting back on defense spending, the second largest expense item after entitlements. Defense spending has risen in recent years due to the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and other costs related to the global war on terror. That said, it's important to highlight that as a percentage of GDP, defense spending in the U.S. remains well below its 60-year trend line. Some of the most strident supporters of America's defense efforts concede that cuts designed to root out inefficiencies could be targeted at the $80 billion spent on tens of thousands of pet projects over the past decade. Programs facing cuts might include the $480 million spent on an extra F-35 joint strike fighter engine that the Pentagon doesn't want, or long-in-the-tooth Cold War defense efforts like the $225 million spent annually to station aircraft in Iceland to monitor bombers and submarines that haven't been around for years, or cuts in some spending related to military personnel. The Esquire commissioned to balance the federal budget, a group of four former senators representing both parties, found over $300 billion in potential defense restructuring opportunities. And in non-defense discretionary spending, which totals 20% of USA Inc. spending, the Government Accountability Office, also known as GAO, identified opportunities to save billions of dollars by eliminating over 100 redundant federal agencies and programs, including 18 programs for food nutrition assistance and 44 overlapping job training programs. Bottom line, USA Inc. must review all of its programs or businesses and figure out if they are run efficiently, and if they're not, how to run them more efficiently and cost-effectively. On the other side of the equation, USA Inc. can attempt to increase our sources of revenue. To approach this problem, we need to look at the history of revenue growth. Over the past 40 years, our average annual GDP growth was 3%. USA Inc.'s tax receipts have been closely correlated with GDP growth. In order to grow our way out of our spending problem without increasing tax rates, 
we'd have to increase GDP growth to 6 to 7 percent annually from 2012 to 2014 and to 4 to 5 percent from 2015 to 2020. This would be far above the country's 40-year average of 3 percent annual revenue growth, practically an impossible mission. However, thoughtful investments in technology, labor, and education could help. Investment in these three areas drove 90 percent of labor productivity growth from 1977 to 2000. Unfortunately, the federal government's investment in these areas has been declining, though, as mentioned earlier, corporate spending on technology R&D has been encouraging. Changing tax policies can also increase revenue. First, we need to look at who pays taxes now. In 2009, only 49 percent of American households paid federal income taxes, down from 67 percent in 2005, per the Joint Committee on Taxation. And the percentage of Americans that pay 50 percent of taxes has fallen by 60 percent from 1965 to 2005. In addition, more and more Americans are on the government payroll or receive government subsidies for retirement income, medical care, housing, and food. This has risen to 36 percent of Americans, up from 20 percent in 1966. We could consider raising taxes. It's notable that tax hikes required to attempt to bring the budget into fiscal balance would likely mean doubling individual income tax rates at a minimum. That's extreme and impractical, but it's the math. In addition, revenue could be raised by reducing various tax credits and deductions. For example, this could include gradually reducing the mortgage interest tax deduction or limiting the tax benefits of other deductions, such as employer contributions to health insurance. When considering changing tax credits or deductions, it's key to ensure that we are incentivizing behavior that is aligned with the most important medium to long-term needs of our country. Increasing tax rates could be self-defeating as it could reduce already low savings levels and slow consumer spending and negatively impact job growth and employment levels. Through many tax credits and deductions, USA Inc. has created incentives to encourage Americans to spend on housing, health care, and current consumption. Meanwhile, savings levels have declined, and investment in productive capital, education, and technology, the very tools needed to compete in the global marketplace, has stagnated. Our financial problems are large and complicated. However, they are not unsolvable. We have solved issues this big and bigger throughout our evolution as a country, including the American Revolution, the Civil War, the Great Depression, and civil rights. We've achieved a man on the moon, the digital revolution, and a system of higher education that is coveted around the world. Things have changed. When you look at the U.S. using several different attractiveness indicators, you find that USA Inc. has declined over the past 10 years on measurements such as business environment, availability of high-quality labor, and transportation and telecommunications infrastructure. We have fallen behind our peers and are falling even further behind on a relative basis. We must restore America's competitive edge. Michael Spence, a Nobel Prize laureate, has said the U.S. government must urgently develop a long-term policy to restore competitiveness and growth, rewarding employment opportunities for a full spectrum of Americans should be a fundamental goal, and education should be boosted. The tax structure also needs to be reformed. Many American leaders have been expressing concerns about America's financial situation and entitlement spending and balance for some time. According to Douglas Elmendorf, the director of the U.S. Congressional Budget Office, the country faces a fundamental disconnect between the services the people expect the government to provide, particularly in the form of benefits for older Americans, and the tax revenues that people are willing to send to the government to finance those services. That fundamental disconnect will have to be addressed in some way if the budget is to be placed on a sustainable course. Paul Volcker, former chairman of the Federal Reserve, has said, there are serious questions most immediately about the sustainability of our commitment to growing entitlement programs. Ben Bernanke, current chairman of the Federal Reserve, has said, the entitlement programs are not self-funded. They are unfunded liabilities. They are the single biggest component of spending going forward. According to the International Monetary Fund, also known as the IMF, the United States needs to accelerate the adoption of credible measures to reduce debt ratios. David Walker, former Comptroller General of the United States, stated America has gone from the world's leading creditor nation to the world's largest debtor nation.
Peter Orzag, former director of the White House Office of Management and Budget, has said it's no exaggeration to say that the United States standing in the world depends on its success in constraining this health care cost explosion. Unless it does, the country will eventually face a severe fiscal crisis or crippling inability to invest in other areas. The United States must make a fundamental change to its health care system, transforming it into one that emphasizes evidence and quality, one in which providers have better tools and much stronger incentives to deliver value. This isn't the time to voice concern about the federal deficit, but be silent about spending cuts. The data and facts imply that our deficit is a very real problem. We need to take the steps to solve this problem. The reality is each of us should consider what we might sacrifice for the future health of our country. We realize there is a disconnect. Again, 80% of us are concerned about the growing federal deficit and national debt. This is a good first step, but meaningless if we're unwilling to act. Remember that more than 60% of us are concerned that major cuts could impact our lives and our families. We all own a part of USA Inc., both its assets and its liabilities. As shareholders, we have a responsibility to ensure our taxes are used wisely and that we get a return on our investment in the form of mutual prosperity. In life, things are often darkest before dawn. We need to get back to the business of building, of sustaining, and of contributing to a country that continues to reinvent itself. We need to reclaim our position as the number one destination for people who dream about a higher quality of life. This job will take everyone. Each one of us has a role to play. Our country has enormous strengths in wealth, human capital, and resilience. A nation on the decline is not the kind of country our grandparents left to us. Let it not be the kind of country we leave to our children. We believe that Americans would like to think that our country has a business plan for the future. The Smith family would have found ways to reduce expenses, even if it meant taking in a renter, the family postponing their vacations for 10 years, or halting all non-essential expenses. They would have tried to increase their income by taking second jobs. What are your thoughts? Should we implement a bottom-to-top and top-to-bottom review of America's operations with a focus on the objectives of our Constitution? Should America run more efficiently, like a business, with clear goals? What incentives should be given for performance against those goals? Which government inefficiencies have you observed, and how would you improve them? If you were borrowing $50 for every $100 in income to meet your spending obligations, what would you do? Are you willing to sacrifice your personal financial interest by receiving fewer benefits or paying higher taxes or retiring at a later age to help make America more competitive? Would these things change the way you vote? Now that you perhaps have more clarity on how USA Inc. spends its money, also known as your tax dollars, would you do it differently if you were in control? If you could choose how you could allocate your income taxes that you pay, would you be aligned with USA Inc.'s fiscal 2010 allocation or would you change it? As a reminder, it was 57% to entitlement programs, 20% to defense, 16% to basic government functions like law enforcement, education, and transportation, and 6% to interest payments. This is a time to stand up and make your voice heard. The data and facts imply that we must let our elected officials know that they have our permission to make the tough decisions, including making the types of spending cuts that can help bring our country back to prosperity again. Policymakers, businesses, and citizens need to share responsibility for past failures and develop a plan for future successes. Our challenges are solvable, but only with collective sacrifice and hard work. Are you ready to rise to the occasion?